This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome the show, Danny Strong. How you doing, Danny? Good, Alex. How you doing? I'm going well, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I've I've been following your career for quite some time, and uh, and of course, uh, a fan of many of the shows that you've worked on and things that you've written. So uh, I'm excited to kind of jump into your process and what we do. So before we get started, how did you get started in this insanity that is the film industry? <laughs> wow, that's a very good question. So. I was a theater major in college okay. um, and I did plays in high school and I was able to get an agent while I was in high school, but I never booked anything. So I was, it was, it wasn't exactly a successful time. Uh, so I never booked anything, but I kept, you know, doing theater nonstop and then majored it in college. And then I booked a couple jobs in college. You know, I booked a couple commercials and then, uh, uh, a role on Say by the Bell, the new class, probably the favorite show of your audience. I think that they, that's all they watch. I think your audience is Say by, and not even the original Say by the Bell, it's the new class that they're particularly <laughs> obsessed with. So I did that. And then, um, and then I didn't really start booking jobs as an actor until I graduated college. And it was a few months after I graduated that I booked an episode of Third Rock from the Sun, which was a huge sitcom. Mm-hmm. And then a month later, I booked an episode of Seinfeld. And so now I kind of went from no resume to two of the biggest sitcoms on television, uh, which was incredibly exciting. And then in the next six months, I booked Buffy the Vampire Slayer and did yeah. that for several years as a recurring. So, so things started happening pretty, pretty fast out of college, although it seems like endless at the time. Um, and then by the, by the time I was 24, I was working full time as an actor in that I was supporting myself um, and I didn't need a day job. So that was very exciting. And, and it was, by the way, I wasn't even working all that much, but I was making enough money uh, with sort of a combination of small guest stars on TV, commercials, voiceover, an occasional movie. Uh, it was real scrappy of just anything I could land, uh, voiceover, radio jobs, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> anything I could get, I did. and. Uh, and then I started writing when I was about 25. And that's when I wrote my first script and uh, didn't sell my first script until I was 32. Wow. So it took seven years of writing before I was able to get my first paycheck as a writer. You know, so that's kind of the fast, the fast version of the... <laughs> of, of, of the beginning of your career. And, yeah. that's, and that's fascinating because, you know, as... So many filmmakers think that it takes, and screenwriters think it's overnight. They're like, "Oh yeah, Danny Strong, he must have just jumped in." Like, it, it, Hollywood loves to put you in a box, and you're the you were in the acting box. So when you try to break out of that box to do something else, it's even that much harder than if you try to go in at the beginning. Is that correct? Well, to be honest with you, that wasn't my experience at all. Um, okay, it was it was the second I started writing scripts. A couple people were a bit eye rolly. <laughs> um, about it, but but the scripts speak for themselves. Okay. So I, you know, once I was able to get some people to read that first script I wrote, well, people really liked it. Um, and then it didn't matter that I was an actor. And most people in the development world, which are the people who read scripts for a living, um, they know that actors that can write make can make really good writers. So it's sort of understood that that's not an unnatural progression from actor to writer. Uh, they've got a real good grasp of dialogue, usually a good grasp of character, uh, and 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 it's and it's many a many a writer, uh, and many writers I've worked with either on staff on one of my TV shows or just screenwriters that I know mm-hmm. started off as actors. Um, so it's it's a natural progression. So no, I I find that Hollywood can follow your lead uh, okay. at times when you say what you want to do. Uh, so I want to do this. It's like okay, well. Are you doing it? Are you trying to do it? <laughs> and then if you are, then then people respond to that. It's it's usually not a situation where no, you're an actor and you will never write. You will never write. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh it's it's really not as close-minded as, as as the perception is. 
Very, very cool. And so, and then as an actor, what did you bring in from being an actor to writing? Like, what were the skill sets that you brought in from just those years of, of working? And I'm assuming being on sets and watching everybody sure. and all that stuff over the years. Yeah, I think that my background as an actor is sort of my biggest weapon as a writer, director, producer, everything. Um, it is, uh, as a writer, it's, I spent years and years reading and working on um the best plays ever written in the history of humanity mm -hmm. right working on the plays of shakespeare and Chekhov and ibsen and edward albee and arthur miller and and i spent years working on that material and you're reading it you're analyzing it you're inside of it uh and i think it's the inside of it that is one of the biggest tools for me as a writer because i write as someone who you know when i when i when i start writing the dialogue uh, I, I write as if I'm inside the scene, playing the scene as as the characters, and um, and that comes from my background as an actor, from spending you know, endless numbers of years just doing that uh, for for a living or doing it for free, you know, doing all the plays <laughs> that I did and all the auditions I did that didn't go anywhere. Um, you're constantly just working on material, um, and 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 that's a different stage of the writing process than the early stages which is the outlining stage. For me, that's what I do, you know, is sort of the, the beginning stages. Um, so, so less my acting background comes into play there. But then when it comes to actually writing the scenes, the acting background is a huge part of it. Do you recommend screenwriters take an acting class or two just to kind of get inside why of it? Why not? Oh, yeah. I mean, why, why, how could that be a bad thing? <laughs> um, and uh, I've been in acting classes, so I stayed in acting classes like I said, I was a theater major at USC, graduated, and then I stayed in acting classes the whole time until my first movie went into production when I was 33. So I spent 11 years in acting classes, uh, and and uh, and my attitude was I, I treated it like I was a professional tennis player, and I just needed to be hitting balls as much as possible. Okay. Um, so I was constantly in class. And, uh, and there would be writers and directors that would, from time to time, come in and they would, you know, be there for three months, two months, that sort of thing. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, they're a director or they're a writer. And, and I couldn't think of a more valuable thing for, for either one of them to do than to, uh, to do that. Now, is it true, I read somewhere that you used to rent videos from video archives and there was a young a, a store clerk that you used to talk to quite often about movies. Is that true? Yeah, so... I, I grew up in Manhattan Beach, California. Very different now than it was then. It was like a, it, now it's very wealthy. When I was a kid there, it was lower middle to lower middle class, sleepy beach town, right? Mm -hmm. And there was this avant-garde video store where they would have foreign films and the films would be uh, categorized by director. Uh, and, uh, and my mom knew I loved adult movies as a kid, so she would, she, she would take me there. And the clerk was this really eccentric young guy and I was 11, but I looked like I was seven. <laughs> uh, and, and I would just spend all this time with him getting advice on certain movies. And, and I spent so much time talking to him that it made my mom feel uncomfortable. She's like, why are you spending so much time talking to him? I'm like, well, I like talking to him. Uh, and it was Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> and it was, and so I, and because I was in there so much, they called me little Quentin. And that was my nickname. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was Little Quentin. And then many years later, Quentin got this huge award from the Home Video Association. <laughs> right. And he asked if I would come to the ceremony. So, and we haven't stayed tight as, as a, you know, in, in my adult age, but, but I'm perfectly friendly, you know, and he loves that I became a writer. And he, uh, and he, um, he at the, in, his, in his big speech to the, big, to the audience, he had me stand up and introduced me as a little Quentin from the video store and, and told the whole story about how I used to rent videos from him. And he had the funniest, and this is how he, literally he ended his speech. It was so funny. He said, uh, he said, so now when I look back upon my career and I see that little Quentin is so successful, oh, I just thank God that I was successful too because if little Quentin was successful and I wasn't, I would blow my fucking brains out. Thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs> what an amazing that it does oh my god that's an amazing story because yeah. it, it's it's on brand for Mr. Tarantino. <laughs> it is. It is very very much on brand. Yeah. And then he finally cast me in a movie which was so exciting. I was in um 
Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, right. That's right. Yeah, and my scene was cut, although it is in the DVD. I heard, yeah, 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 yeah. Scene you can. Uh, and it was uh, and, and, uh, it was an amazing experience getting to watch him direct for a day. Oh my really God. inspiring person. That must have been awesome. Now, you know, with all the, you know, being an actor, you deal with a tremendous amount of rejection. And I'm assuming as a writer, you do as well. How do you deal with rejection? Because we get mostly, if I may say, we get mostly no's than rather than yeses in this business, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's all no, all the time. I mean, that, that was why I started writing, was that I was working as an actor. Like I said, I was supporting myself, but yet all year long, I would hear no, and the no would be no, they don't want to see you for the part. No, you didn't get the call back, or no, you didn't get the part. Uh, and that's literally, you know, three, four times a week, that's what you're getting. Mm-hmm. And it's maybe once every three or four months, you're finally getting a yes, and it grates on you. So for me, I actually started writing to deal with the sort of um, subconscious trauma of being rejected (laughs) all year long. And then I remember there was a period of about 18 months when I couldn't get arrested as an actor. I just went into this, I don't know what happened. I just couldn't get hired. And then that was part of the seven years where no one was buying my scripts. So it was like a brutal 18 months of, um, of things not working out. Now, what's great about writing versus acting is that as a writer, you can go do it. So... Mm-hmm. You can just you can just go write a script. It doesn't matter if someone has bought it, if someone's interested in it. You can literally just sit down and write whenever you want or whenever you have availability based on if you have a job, et cetera, right? But you can go do it. And so for my attitude is, particularly on the writing, uh, when you write a script uh, and then you're ready to show it to people or to take it out to market, whatever that means, um, you should be working on your next script. Uh, so that when the, the no's do start coming in and the no's come to people at the highest levels of the industry, they have the biggest screenwriters and biggest directors, you know, they're, well, this will only get made if I can get Leonardo DiCaprio or Tom Cruise. And then they send it to Leonardo DiCaprio or Tom Cruise and they go, no, we don't want to do the movie, you know? So though everyone deals with that, but as a writer, what you can do is you can just go start working on your next script. And it really does help get your mind off the rejection because you're creatively grooving on something new. Now, do you, what is your writing process? Do you start with character? Do you start with plot? Do you outline? Yeah, it's, it's a combination of things. It's sort of hard to say because it differs for every project, but I will say the one place that is pretty kind of the standard starting point for me is research, right? So if I'm writing a true story like in Dope Sick, it's the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. Well, I just start reading books and then I'll usually read two books on something. Just read them without even taking notes. So I get a sense of the global macro of the story. I get a sense of characters that have kind of popped for me. You know, hopefully these books are good. (laughs) Hopefully you picked the right ones. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, and by the way, uh, I go to a certain amount of research to figure out what are the right books. You know, sometimes there's only one book, uh, depending on what it is. But but um, or even if it's a fictional piece, I'll start with research. You know, when I started uh, when I wrote Empire, the pilot, I started just watching documentaries on hip hop. Right. Just let me just watch some hip hop documentaries. So 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 that's phase one, which is just get information coming in. And and maybe note taking, maybe not. Then once I kind of feel like I've got a sense of the global. So let's say there's two books on something that I've read and I'm like, oh, I really get this now. Then I go reread those books. But now I'm taking careful notes and I'm writing notes. I'm writing characters. I'm writing scenes. I'm I'm writing all this information because um, uh, things can inspire other things. Mm -hmm. Uh, Right. So I, I can I can get I can get it'll be like oh this oh look at it there's a whole sequence that I'm coming up with based upon a sentence you know when I adapted the book Game Change into the movie Game Change there was one paragraph that was the gave me the inspiration for the entire film and I was like oh that's the whole movie right there that one paragraph where it talked about Steve Schmidt did this and then he did this and then he had to do this. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like my entire movie. <laughs> and, by the way, and it was. And it outlined it for you. On the film. 
yeah. yeah, was was essentially inspired from that paragraph. But so so that's what it is. So then it's like taking notes, writing scene ideas, character ideas. Sometimes it's stuff from the books or the documentaries. Sometimes all it does is is it starts inspiring ideas, and then I go off on my own tangent entirely. And then once I've finished the that stage of the research, and this is important, uh, don't get bogged down indefinitely in the research because you could you could do that for three years if you want, right? Mm-hmm. So what I do is is literally I I try to do enough of it where I feel like oh. I've got a sense of what this is and how I could pull this off. Um, then I'll start actually outlining from those set of notes and kind of free form thinking that I've done. And then once I have an outline, uh, before I go write the script, sometimes what I'll do is I'll go read another book or I'll go read two more books. You know, sometimes there's like 20 books written on something, right? Mm-hmm. And then there's a new set of ideas that come in. Uh, and then from there, then I go actually write the script. Now, do you, I always love asking creators this. There's, I always say that there's this kind of well of inspiration that is ours that we can tap into. It's kind of like almost being in the flow or in that state of mind, the flow state of mind. What is it in your actual writing process that allows you to tap into your creativity, that inspiration, the muse for better or worse? Because sometimes the muse shows, sometimes she doesn't. You know, How do you tap into that? Uh, so I don't. I just show up every day. And she shows – and you let her know, hey, I'm going to be here if you're ready. <laughs> I'm just there. I'm there every day, and I'm going to do something. Some days there will be – today I had all these great plans. Those plans <laughs> did not succeed, but I did get something done. You know? okay. uh, and literally it happened today. Um, and, and But something was achieved today, right? So, so it's really a matter of just showing up every day. And, you know, I say that inspiration is for amateurs. And I don't mean that in a, in a hostile way. You know, if you're, say, a lawyer and you want to write a book and you've always had this novel you wanted to write or you wanted to write a, a memoir of a case you had, right? Well, you're not a professional writer, um, but you're going to try it. By the way, you may be great at it. It's very possible that you are. But that's the kind of person who's like, I need to be inspired and maybe I need oh, to yeah. rent a, a house by a lake <laughs> right. and go, you know, and go away because that's what writers do. And it's very romantic. Right. For me, I'm a professional writer. I've been writing now for 22 years. Um, and, and of those 22 years, I've been getting paid 15 of those years, <laughs> which has its own set of. I mean, it sounds incredible, but there's a whole lot of stress that comes from taking people's money and mm-hmm. delivering a script to them, right? So so it's literally a matter of, no, I just have to go do it. Uh, now I'm at a point where I'm trying to take days off, uh, where I'm like, just, you shouldn't write on Sunday. You need to take Sunday off. You know, my fiance does not appreciate it. <laughs> she, she would like me to take Sunday off. Uh, and so it, the, it's, it's um, but that act of doing it consistently what it does is that you do it then for the rest of the day your mind is processing things that you don't even know it's processing uh you may have hit some walls that day uh then you come back the next day and you have solutions to those walls that your mind has just figured out on its own throughout the course of the day Mm -hmm. i've had so many solutions to problems come to me when i wake up in the morning and it's sometimes it's that it's that period where um, you're not fully awake, but you're kind of starting to get awake. Oh, this is the best part. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and then I'll be like, but that solution wouldn't have showed up that next morning had I not had the session the day before. Right. So it's it's the consistency of the back to back of it is is what I think is 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 what I do. And, and I think it's incredibly important. Now, you, you one of your scripts uh, got to the top of the blacklist, which is recount. Um, yeah. Was that the, was that the, you know, was, was the town or was Hollywood taking you, like taking notice of your writing, you know, heavily or, I mean, cause when you get to the top of the blacklist, everybody in town knows who you are. Was that like a career defining moment for you as a writer? You know, it actually wasn't because the script had already exploded. Okay. The script had blown up and become a huge deal. And then had already gone into production and I actually found out about the blacklist on the plane ride home after we wrapped production. Oh Jesus. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? Like I was sitting on the plane going through my phone and then someone congratulated and I didn't really know what it was. 
and what was great was that was the year the blacklist kind of became famous. And there were all these newspaper articles on the blacklist. And so to be number one on the blacklist the year the blacklist becomes famous, that's a very cool year to become number <laughs> one on the blacklist, right? So, um, so it didn't uh, – the, the script had already sort of changed everything for me before that. That was just a really neat kind of cherry on top. Now, how did you approach adapting uh, The Hunger Games, uh, Mockingjay? Because, I mean, yeah. at, at the point that you came in on it, it already is a pretty well-established franchise, and there has to be slight pressure on you. <laughs> yeah, the pressure's enormous. That was a very strange job because there was this enormous, you know, it was one of the biggest jobs in the business at the time. Yeah. Everyone, yeah, I mean, it was just like the, the first one was the biggest movie of the year. The second one was in production. Um, and so you had two go pictures. The franchise was particularly strong. Um, and that that first movie was really terrific. Um, everyone really respected it. Uh, the book, uh, the books were really beloved amongst a huge swath of age range. Yeah, um, so it was, uh, it, it was just, I was really flattered when I got asked to pitch on it. I was told they've gone out to 10 writers and I'm one of the 10. And to me, that was the win. I'm like, oh my God, how cool is that? That I'm like one of the 10 that they've asked mm -hmm. to, to pitch on this. And then lo and behold, I get the job, right? Um, wow. Now, I hadn't even read the books before they had come to me to pitch. And, and they asked me in that, in that meeting, they said, have you read the books? I said, no, I haven't. I said, I saw the first movie and I loved it. Um, and they said, well, okay, read the next two books as fast as you can and then come up with a pitch. So that's what I did. Um, and then the job itself, it was very unusual because it was, um, they wanted it to be really close to the book. There wasn't a lot of room for veering away from the book, right. which I totally understood and didn't disagree with. Then at the same time, they wanted some new ideas. Of course. But they didn't like my new ideas. <laughs> yeah, right? Right. So I'd like pitch new ideas and I'd always get like, mm, no, mm, no, <laughs> you know. And so, I, you know, and it was just this weird tightrope where I, I was like, wow, I'm a really, really high paid plagiarist. You know, they just want me to stick to the book. So then I wrote the first you know, part one of Mocking Jay, and um, they really liked it, and they hired me to write part two. Uh, and I was, I, I was like, okay. <laughs> it was, by the way, it wasn't. Um, I didn't love doing the job, to be honest with you, because of everything I just explained. It right. was just weird. I mean, I was like, it was like we want this really close to the book, okay, but but then we want other things, okay, but we don't like what you're pitching, okay, but we do like you now, <laughs> you know. Um, and it was, I didn't, I just didn't enjoy working on it, but then they hired me to do the next one, which was, I mean, it was like, well, I can't say no right. to that. Uh, so, so then I did, uh, I did the next one and then they brought in another writer, which was the first time that had happened to me. You know, they, they had me do, uh, rewrites. No, no. They had them do rewrites on three. And then I finished four and I turned in four. And then by that point, they really liked the writer who did rewrites on three. And they had him do rewrites on four. And they sent me on my merry way. They said, bye. This is a, it was a pleasure. Not really. Uh, and, uh, and I was actually quite happy to move on from the job, to be honest with you. Very honest answer to that. They're very, that's a... But that's what, but yeah, that's how it went. It was, it was like I wrote three. They liked it. They hired me to write four while they simultaneously hired someone to do rewrites on three. They did that because um, they were shooting them at the same time. So there was they in their minds, there wasn't enough time. Uh, and and then so then I wrote four. Then that same writer came on, Peter Craig, lovely guy. And then they had him do rewrites on four. And uh, and that that was uh, the end of my my journey on the Hunger Games. And that's the thing that a lot of writers don't think that they think, oh well, you know, Danny Strong's not going to get you know rewritten or it happens to everybody. I, I talked to Eric Roth and it happened to Eric Roth. Oh yeah, it's also not in, in movies at that budget. It's extremely common, right? Um, and in this case, there were two movies before in which these huge writers, the Academy Award nominated or winning writers were rewritten. So I kind of knew going into it that that's kind of the deal. 
Um, and it was and it was pretty common uh, for big budget tentpole movies to have multiple writers on them. So it's not like you, I go in, I, I, I don't go into that job thinking, oh, this is my artistic vision. Right. I sort of go into the job hoping that I can get through it without having people upset with me. <laughs> Fair uh, it, which, by the way, is not, a, you know, and, and I haven't done a job like that since because of it, though. Yeah, and you, I'm sure I, you've been offered. I'm sure you've been offered. No, I get offered all the time, you know, different things. And and, um, and I'm, yeah, and I have done a few uh, in that time period since then. But for the most part, um, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it was a very good life learning experience of, situations i'd prefer not to be in right and that's kind of where and you've made your bones heavily in television where the writer is more king especially yeah well it's a combination of a few things which is um right at this time the the medium started changing right where movie dramas started becoming smaller and smaller or not being made at all right. and then there's massive tentpole movies you know like what i was working on but i didn't enjoy working on it so i didn't want to do that again so literally for the next year and a half after hunger games i was getting offered uh sort of big tentpole things and i didn't want to do them uh, so then the drama that i want to be working on they're not really making anymore uh, so uh, but i go and i make an independent film mm -hmm. um and then simultaneously television is now starting to take off uh dramatically creatively in in many ways to a number of writers feeling like that's actually a much more interesting space to work in um, uh, on, on a multiple different levels. So it was like the business starts changing. Uh, I was very fortunate that right when that happened, I created the show Empire that was a massive hit. So now <laughs> I've got like cachet uh, and some, uh, you know, a lot of interest in me in a space that is simultaneously kind of becoming the booming space. Uh, so the timing was, was really great. And, uh, I feel very fortunate. Now I have to ask you, cause I mean, I, I'm a huge empire fan. I watched every episode. I loved empire. I, I think I caught up to it on season. I think you guys were in season three and someone said, you got to watch empire. So I, I binged the first season and I was just like, the writing was so tight. The characters were so outlandish. Oh, they were beautiful. How did you. What made you jump into this world? I mean, I'm assuming you, you, you haven't been hardcore hip hop your entire life. So how did you yeah. jump in? What was great was the only person who knew less about hip hop than me was Lee Daniels. <laughs> so the two of us literally would joke about how we know nothing about hip hop, right? But what had happened was I wrote the movie The Butler that Lee Daniels right. directed. Mm -hmm. And then we had become pretty close in post-production on that project. Uh, where he really valued my feedback and notes. And, and it was the kind of thing where... He started, you know, just saying, like, what are we doing next? What are we doing next? We're magic together. We're magic together. And that was before the film came out and succeeded. Right. So then I um, came up with this idea to do King Lear and a hip hop empire, you know, which is what empire was. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I pitched the idea to Lee Daniels as a movie and he loved it. He just said, that's I love this idea. And then it was his idea, which was let's do it as a TV show instead of a movie. Uh, and I thought, that's perfect. You're absolutely right. It's about a family fighting, which is what TV shows are, are about, <laughs> is about families fighting with each other. So so that's how it all came together, was, was an idea I had that I brought to Lee based on the fact that we had just done The Butler together. And then The Butler comes out, and it was a huge hit. Mm -hmm. You may not remember it, mm -hmm. but it was one of the sleeper hits of the year, yeah. particularly for a movie that no one wanted to make. Yeah, uh, not a tentpole you know, by any by any stretch. Yeah, the opposite of a tentpole, right? It's kind of like sort of in the category of one of the last dramas of that era when they would make these kinds of dramas, right? Mm -hmm. That had this kind of sweep and uh, emotion to it. Um, and so uh, so we took this pitch out with with having just had this big hit drama, and then we had multiple bidders, and then um, and then that was that. So that's how it began. It was a random idea I had one day listening to a radio uh, news piece on a deal Sean Combs had just closed. And I just thought hip hop so, so cool and dynamic and exciting. And I got to do a, a musical in hip hop. <laughs> That's right. really, the fact that I knew nothing about hip hop did not deter me uh, <laughs> whatsoever. And then uh, it's funny because when I did pitch Lee thinking, well, I don't know much about this world, but I'll dive into it, but Lee will know a lot about it. And then literally he's like, I don't know anything about hip hop. 
And I'm like, really? He's like, no. <laughs> and, and I'm like, me neither. So, so that's where that's where Empire began. That's amazing that neither of you had a hip hop knowledge uh, that you could bring to the table. <laughs> no, he was really into Marvin Gaye, and uh, like like it was like loved Marvin Gaye and kind of that era of Motown. Sure. Uh, and uh, and I loved that era of Motown too, you know. Uh, even though I feel like some of my taste even went further back to the fifties, and, right. and uh, it's pretty funny uh, how these things can happen. But I think I think the lesson in that is uh, you don't have to live a life to write about it or to direct it. And that is a that is not a popular opinion right now. Um, and there's very much right. this discussion right now of uh, who gets to tell what story, and if you haven't lived it, you don't have the right to tell it. And I fundamentally disagree with that. Um, and I just think, well, if, if you had to live everything you wrote, then just let's go set fire to most of Shakespeare's plays. You know, all the Shakespeare plays that don't take place in England, you know, even Macbeth, that doesn't count because that's Scotland. Who the hell does he think he is to write a play <laughs> about someone in Scotland? You know, I mean, let's just take uh, let's take Hamlet sure. and shut, set that on fire, right? So I just I just fundamentally disagree with it. It goes against sort of my entire background as an actor, stage actor, lover of right. drama, et cetera. So so an, an empire is a, is a prime example of literally two guys that didn't know anything about hip hop. Uh, and then we draw upon different things and what we don't know, we learn. And, uh, and then, you know, and then when it goes to series in that writer's room, we've got multiple writers in there that know a lot about hip hop. Uh, yeah. and, and they become real huge assets to it in, in, in keeping the show alive. You know, it's funny because, you know, I had Taylor Hackford on the show and we were talking about Ray, which is one of the best, one of the best, you know, musical movies. Yeah, uh, incredible. An incredible film. And he was telling me, he's like, Ray wanted me to do it. And, but in today's world, I would have never been allowed to do Ray. And I'm like, wow, yeah. what a, what a devastating blow <laughs> to cinema that you wouldn't have been able to make Ray. It's, I agree with you hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, there's there's like, I don't know, that doesn't mean to not be cognizant of certain sensitivities. Sure. Or, of course. Of course. You know, it, it's like, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think everything has its own sort of um, has its own path. And we're doing a pilot uh, right now that I'm producing. Um, and it's it's basically eight women are the leads of this pilot. Right. And um, uh, the, the network wants a woman director. And I could not agree more. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, of course, of course, it should be a woman director. It's about eight women, <laughs> right? It's it's like, a, and the the creator is a woman. But it just seems to me like I, you know, that that's a, a perfect example of as, as us out looking to hire a director. Uh, my partner on it uh, on the producing side is a famous male director, uh, and he completely agrees. He's like, yeah, we we need to find a woman. So so it's like every every kind of project has its own path or life, but. As a writer, if you're not getting, you know, if this is not an open writing assignment and you want to write something uh, that has nothing to do with your life experience, go write it. That's, you're you know? absolutely, you're absolutely yeah, right. Write, it. write now, what you want, write what you're passionate about. One of my favorite char characters of Empire and arguably one of the best characters written for television in the past 15 years, Cookie. How the hell did you come up with Cookie and how much did uh, Tahaja, uh, I can never pronounce her name, Tahaja. Tahaja, yeah. How did she influence that character. So Cookie Lion, um, which I think is hilarious that it could be on my tombstone. He co-created Cookie Lion. <laughs> uh, uh, is a is a it it came from um, so the show is King Lear and a hip hop empire, but it's also the Lion in Winter and a hip hop empire. It's sort of both of those classical pieces. And Eleanor of Aquitaine is uh, Henry the Second's wife that he would put into uh, um, you know, like a dungeon, you know, that he he'd put her in exile all year long. And then every year at Christmas time, he would let her out um, of exile to see the family. And in the play, The Lion in Winter, <laughs> the play takes place during Christmas time when he lets Eleanor of Aquitaine out of prison and she just fucks his shit up, right? <laughs> like literally she just shows up and tries to derail all of his legacy plans. And that was one of like the early ideas I had for Empire, which was um, that it would be sort of a fake, um, you know, like like a, a fictional uh, Jay-Z who was older, you know, right. he, like an, he had an empire like Jay-Z, but he was older 
with these three older sons and that and that his wife went to prison selling drugs and that drug money is what created is what is was the origin story of his right. empire All right. so that the pilot would begin with what's the inciting incident she gets out of prison and he doesn't know it and she's coming back to get what she wants what she deserves what's hers right and she wants half the company and she wants her beloved son the only one that would visit her in prison uh and the most talented to be take over the family company and he should take over the family company except for the simple fact that he's gay and his father fucking hates him for being gay because <laughs> he's intensely homophobic right so that was that was like the genesis of cookie lion that she was very much inspired by eleanor of aquitaine um and it, and, it, and, it, and it comes from that and then lee daniels had a sister um that kind of had this vibe uh, that he would talk to me about. And I remember when I pitched Lee the, the, the movie, when it was still a movie, and I, I talked about Eleanor and Aquadane, everything I just said to you, mm -hmm. I, I said to him in a shorter version, and I said, so this role, she's going to be like an expert in music, and she's going to become the music manager to her gay son. And I said, she's going to be like Mama Rose on crack. And Lee Daniels starts screaming, yes, darling, yes, Mama goes on crack, darling, I love it. You know, it was sort of like, you know, like, it was like I said the perfect thing to get Lee excited about, about this idea. Um, and that was, uh, that, was, that was the genesis of it. So then once we got to shooting it, it went from the writer's role to Taraji's role. And Taraji is a genius, a, a two, a, well, I don't know, day two into shooting. Lee and I were in awe of her in the pilot. We knew this could be, if the show was successful, we felt this would be a breakout character because she was just, just like she blew us out of the water, you know, on just everything she did. And the part very much, I think, um, uh, it, it was an amalgamation of the writers, but of her too, as far as she would, she would um, sometimes improvise. She would sometimes just tweak dialogue just a little bit. Sometimes she would pare dialogue down. Um, and and I actually really learned how to write Cookie by following Taraji's lead and seeing kind of the stuff that she would reject or the stuff that she would she would improvise really inspired a lot. And I remember in shooting the pilot, she had uh, Anika shows up and it's 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 uh, her her ex-husband's new girlfriend. Right. <laughs> and it's literally and it's the first time I think the audience sees Anika and it's certainly the first time Cookie sees Anika. And I had written some, you know, comp some just like dig that she does. And Taraji took me aside. We got along like gangbusters, me and Taraji. And she said uh, she says, like, I don't know about this. And I don't even remember what I'd written. And I said, oh, well, just say whatever you want. And she went, really? I go, yeah, just say whatever you want, right? <laughs> At this point, I had come, I've come to understood that this woman's a genius. <laughs> and, uh, and so she goes, she starts to exit. She stops. She looks at her. And she goes, mm-mm-mm, boo-boo kitty. And then walks out. <laughs> I never heard of boo-boo kitty. I had no idea what she was talking about. But I was <laughs> laughing so fucking hard that I almost ruined the take, except Lee Daniels was laughing as hard as I was. It was just like, it oh was just God. like, oh, you're a genius. Just you do it, and we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll follow your lead. <laughs> That's amazing. That's a great cookie yeah. story. That's a great yeah. cookie story. <clears throat> now, you've obviously run a lot of writer's rooms. What is it that you look for as a showrunner in writers for your writer's room? I look for writers that – and. I look for writers that are bold, um, that aren't afraid, um, that have a sense of originality. You know, one of the first things I say on day one, day one of school, is I say, I don't want you to think about what you think the network wants or what you think the studio wants or what you think the audience wants or what you think what I want. I don't want you to think about any of that. I want you to think about what you think is great, right? We're going to follow our own instincts because uh, many writers that have been staffed on a lot of shows, you know, they're very, they seem very kind of programmed, trained, uh, right. trained about the network because of network notes. And then, and then they write to the network's taste 
Um, I don't do that ever. Um, I write to my taste and then I use the network to help me make it better, right? So I don't do what they want, I do what I want. And then I listen to their notes though on how I could improve it. And it's very collaborative and it goes very well. <laughs> you know, I don't have big blowout fights with my studio and my network. In fact, most of the time we have a very fun, positive relationship and experience. And I'm very open to notes, but I'm not open to dictation. And I think it's a bad idea because if, if they could, if, if they're in charge of something, well, they should be writing it, <laughs> right? Like I'm the one that has to execute it. And that philosophy, which is highly respectful of them as essentially editors, has served me very well politically, but more important has served me very well creatively, where I get a lot of great feedback uh, mm -hmm. from, from, from my, my producers and my studio executives and my network executives. And I think people that come into that relationship, A, thinking that they're idiots and they're adversaries, I think it's a way to fail. And then be people that go into that relationship just wanting to please them or wanting to write to what they think their taste is, is they're not following their artistic self and their artistic soul. And, and I think that the writer, you know, uh, particularly on a TV show, needs to be there. And, and on a movie, that's where I'm at, too. Until, until I'm, you know, let go, until the director has said, thank you for the, your, the script, now go fuck yourself, right? <laughs> it can happen in film. Although most of my experiences on film has been that the director and I have gotten along very well and I'm, I've stayed part of the process mm -hmm. all the way through. Um, but there is a power dynamic where once they're there, they're in charge. So then I have to maneuver, you know, kind of my way to either stay in their good graces or to, sure. you know, so then it becomes like a different thing. Um, but, but a game worth playing, I think, for long-term success on, on multiple fronts. Now, TV is different. You know, I'm in charge if I'm the showrunner creator. By the way, I supervise showrunner creators and I don't boss them around. I don't tell them what to do. I'm like there to like help. Be like, hey, what do you think of this? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll have a note and then sometimes I'll pitch three or four solutions only to help demonstrate what the note is. Um, and then B, maybe one of these ideas will work for them. Maybe not, but maybe it'll inspire something else. Mm -hmm. So so it's really... Um, it's really uh, going back to your question, you know, day one, it's like, let's not write for the network and let's not write for what we think the audience wants, because that's such a the audience. I mean, put four people in a room and they'll all want different things out of story. Right. 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 We need to lead the audience. And, and sometimes there are things that don't work in the story. Uh, right. That it's not clear or there's not enough depth or it's or it's. Um, kind of lame, right? You know, like there's things that can be improved. Uh, and that's what I'm open to of like, how, how can I make this better? How can I make it deeper, funnier? If it's a, if it's a thriller, more suspenseful, right? Depending on what genre you're working in. Um, and then how can you find some things to subvert the genre so that it's rich and, and doesn't feel expected or, or it can be multidimensional in tone and, and, and style, you know, there's all sorts of things I'm trying to achieve um, and worrying about what the network thinks uh, is not one of them. I'm more worried. I'm more like looking forward to hopefully trusting them so that it'll be like, okay, so here it is. So help me. Like, give me some thoughts. Like, how can I make it better? Great, great answer. I love that answer. Sorry if I babbled on too long. No, no, that was a great answer. Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests what advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Follow your bliss, like write, don't write what you think the market wants, write what you think is going to be great. You know, and sometimes the weirdest scripts and ideas make people's careers um, because they just loved, and by the way, the movie never got made, but it launched their career. It got them an agent, a manager, it got them up, for, oh. you know, for jobs, right? So, so it's really about, um, it's really about writing every day uh, or five days a week is good. You know, like you can take the weekends off. Five days a week is good. Uh, four days a week in borderline three days a week. You're an amateur writer now, you know. Um, but so so, you know, getting a lot of writing done because you improve as you write um, constantly working on projects and then don't write what you think the marketplace wants. Write what you think is great. Write what you want to see. 
Uh, I've got friends that are professional, that were professional writers that had a lot of success. Um, and for whatever reason, you know, things have, have gone different ways for them. And, and sometimes they're still chasing the market. And I don't understand, like, and the, the market changes weekly. By the way, the market's so different now than what it was five years ago, three years ago, five years ago. Uh, I don't even really completely understand the film market anymore uh, to a certain extent. And I think it's different for almost every buyer. I mean, I get, you know, if you, I, I know they all want to make Spider-Man. Like, that I get, right? <laughs> you know, I just want to write Spider-Man on every script I write and turn it in and see if I can gonna pay me, motherfuckers. <laughs> Spider-Man. Um, exactly. Like, besides that, it just becomes a whole intricate sort of dance. And I think the the thing that I do is if I have an idea I'm really excited about, I I then will figure out, okay, so how how can this get done? What's the pathway to production? to get this made, you know, oh, this is actually something, you know, HBO Max could be really into or something that A20, this is a perfect A24 movie, right? That doesn't mean if A24 passes, you're dead, but but you're like, it kind of gives you a sense of, okay, it's, this is A24, this is more like a universal, like I'll think about who, who makes these kinds of things. Um, and, and then what budget does it need to be? You know, if it's uh, something that's a period piece that, you, you know, that that's like a period drama that's really small. Well, obviously, I can't write a script that's going to cost $60 million to make. Right. Because it's most likely not going to get made unless David Fincher or Martin Scorsese. Really, you know, Scott. Yeah, really, Scott. Does. By the way, you you may, you may could end up landing one of them, right? Um, but 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 for the most part, it's sort of like, well, okay, so, so how can I make this for $5 million, $10 million, $1 million, $2 million? You know, is there a path to that? Right. Um, so, so there's, there's a number of things you can think about on the business side, but first and foremost, start with the creative side and start with like, like, oh my God, I would love to see this movie. Oh my God, I could write the hell out of this movie. I could crush this movie. Um, uh, because that's how things get made. That's how writing careers flourish. Um, okay. is, 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 is that, that's my advice. That's great advice. Uh, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Uh, what I just told you. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, 100% true. It took me six years, something like that, to figure out, oh, because I was writing high concept comedies all through my 20s. Oh, okay. Because Jim Carrey comedies were those, those like mm -hmm. real high, like Liar Liar and, mm -hmm. and Bruce Almighty. Those were the biggest hits. And I was trying to write comedies. So obviously I got to write these because that's what the market wants. And, um, and they were pretty good. You know, I, I did a pretty good job. I got some attention from them, and but none of them sold. And then all of a sudden, seven years later, I'm like, wow, I've just spent seven years writing movies that is not really my thing. Good. <laughs> right? Good advice. And last question, three of your favorite films of all time or three screen uh, pilots that anyone, the screenwriter should read, either one? Hmm. Well, I would say my three favorite, favorite films are apocalypse now mm -hmm. the sweet smell of success mm -hmm. why don't we say at number three we'll say chinatown all, all good choices and uh, yeah, all three pilots those are, those are all three of my favorites um um three pilots well a madman pilot yeah wowza yeah that's something to behold um Trying to because pilots are hard because you're setting so much stuff up. They're really hard. Um, I you know I, I don't know if it's one of my favorites of all time, but a great pilot and a great show from this last year um, was Hacks. Yeah, that was, that's a great pilot, and um, and the show's fantastic. It's probably one of my favorite things of the year. Um, um, was Hacks, and uh, you know really set up these two characters and these two different places. And I remember there was a scene towards the end. Because one's a comic and one's a comedy writer, and they just start shit talking each other in comedy, and it was like you know, uh, <laughs> it, it it just was like uh, like Star Wars with two lightsabers <laughs> battling each other, except in their case, their lightsabers what were their comedy skills, and so it was hilarious and character driven and tense all at once, which made it pretty effing genius. Um, so big, uh, big hacks fan. Um, I don't know. I, it's tough. You know, you know what's a, 
I, I, I maybe I'm biased to have a limited series this year with Dope Sick, but I think the limited series space is, is pretty incredible. Mm-hmm. The number of shows out this year, um, they're so well done. You know, Mayor of Eastwood uh, or Mayor of Easttown. Mm-hmm. Mayor of Easttown. I keep calling it Mayor of Eastwood. Um, yeah. Or is that correct? <laughs> It might be East. No, I'm not sure if it's East. I think it's East. Whatever it is, it's fucking great. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like White Lotus is great and uh, Underground Railroad. Queen's Gambit. Yeah. But Queen's Gambit's unbelievable. Um, So there's these pieces that they're, they're, I don't know, to me, they're in some ways more exciting than movies. I get more excited about these these kind of um, prestige limited series right now. Um, And and that they're, I just get more caught up in them. and, And they seem to break out in a bigger way um, than movies have for a little while. I mean, I don't know what movie was as big as the Queen's Gambit was that year, Jeez. right? Um, well, look at Squid so, Games. I mean, look at Squid Games, for God's sakes. Yeah, yeah, and Squid Games is, is an ongoing, but it's it's uh, it's just there's some really explosive, rich stuff happening uh, in that space right now. Danny, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, my friend. I thank you so much for taking out the time, and please continue to make uh, great television, great work out there. We really appreciate you, man. Oh, Alex, thanks so much, man. It was so much fun chatting with you. And uh, and thank you to everyone listening to this. I really appreciate it.